Hello. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Did you want me to talk a bit more, or just uh, e oh, okay? A B C D E F G H. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? I'll pick up where Ansar left off. J K L M N O P Q R. <laughs> Hi everyone. That was kind of cool. A little spooky. All right, how's it going? Good. All right, hi everyone. Hi. <laughs> That's always my favorite part because it's like, no, yeah, we have to start with a hello. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, is it anyone's first time at the People's Forum? Amazing. Oh, I love this. Well, welcome. We're the People's Forum. We're a space for political education and cultural work, um, and we do that a multitude of ways: programming. Um, films, but especially kind of seminars like this in which we create the space for the discussions to happen around con like things that we're all experiencing that we all need to find a way to respond to. Um, and I think the climate crisis is one of the most urgent topics of our reality right now. I mean, I was walking to work today and I was loving it because it is so warm outside, but I was a little bit spooked. I was a little bit spooked in the middle of December to be sweating. Um, anyway, so I say with that because I think the climate crisis has been at the forefront of a lot of people's thoughts recently. I mean, for us, many of us in New York City, we saw, you know, the perp the orange skies that we had on top of the flash flooding, on top of so much, back to back to back. Um, so there's no denying that the climate crisis is a reality right now, and we have to find ways to find solutions for it because as long as this capitalist system continues, the Earth will never be at the priority. Humanity will never be the priority. But you know, the priority is always going to be money, and with that attitude, we will continue to drive our like humanity and the planet down. Um, so that's why I'm really excited for today's conversation, because we get to talk about what are the ways in which people are finding solutions for the climate crisis. You know, what are what can we learn from them? What are their shortcomings? And really have an honest discussion on that, particularly of the role of technological interventions. So I'm very excited. We have an amazing, amazing panel today. Really excited. Um, we have our physical ph physical theorist. Or oh, go ahead. <laughs> Physicist to theoretical physicist. There it is. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> man, I switched them yeah. up. Um, Ansar, Ansar Faizuddin and uh, Andrew Shang, who's a researcher and organizer, and really excited. I'm going to give a quick rundown um, for folks in person. We have like some folks online and some folks in person. For in person, when it comes time for Q and A towards the latter half, um, think of your questions throughout, and we'll like have time for Q and A. And if you have a question or a comment, just raise your hand and wait for me to bring you the mic. I know it feels a little weird because we're all we can see each other, but it's so our comrades online can hear us. And then for our comrades online, if you have a question or comment, at any time, feel free to type it in the chat. I do ask that you keep it related to the course, related to the discussion. Um, I would love to hear about your cat, your pet cat another day. <laughs> um, but yeah, and if, when it comes time for Q&A, we'll raise them as well. Thank you so much, and I'll pass it to you all. Thanks. Yeah, um, th thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so 
I want to start with just a sort of a brief introduction of like you know where we're coming from. So, so Andres and I we belong to Science for the People. It's a group of uh, radical scientists and lay people who understand that all science is done in a social context, and yet it's not determined by that social context. Um, and sometimes science can at times be a hotly contested terrain in which you know competing explanations sort of vie for uh, predominance. Um, and one um, like very broadly conceived domain is sort of the contest between the contingent and the inevitable. Um, so there's a tremendous social pressure to justify specific social phenomena as in ineluctable um, expressions of underlying laws of nature. Um, a prominent example on which uh, Science for the People left a really indelible mark was a sort of the dismantling of the ostensibly scientific explanations that naturalized the stratification of our society in, uh, along sort of gender and racial lines. Um, and the, the ecological crisis poses another such situation where the particularities of um, capitalist accumulation are normalized as immutable laws of human nature and eco-destruction a consequence of a supposed human tendency to want to dominate nature rather than the aberration that it really is of our humanity. Um, so in the face of this catastrophe, we can and we must uh, change the course that we're on. So our uh, topic of discussion today is climate change and technology. Um, we're meeting in the midst of an ecological crisis, um, as uh, you know, as Sadie mentioned, all these uh, phenomena that we actually have been living through. Um, and, and climate is only, but climate is only one aspect of this crisis. Um, but it is a good starting point to begin thinking about the, the sort of general ecological crisis. Um, and technology is ubiquitous, and its promise and perils are uh, really motifs of the present. I mean, they're constantly in the news and constantly discussing it. And as w we know, the COP28 is underway now, and it will be dominated by uh, proposals for technological solutions to the climate crisis, including geoengineering and nuclear power. I mean, today, today there's a big story about um, how um, uh, you know, nuclear power is being promoted, and um, there's this proposal to triple um, the uh, number of um, such uh, power plants and so on. Um, so. So I'm going to organize my contribution as a series of interrelated remarks um, rather than presenting a single ar argument. Um, so, um, anyway, so um, bear with me, and uh, you know, uh, please uh, jump in if there's any if there are any questions. So, uh, so my point one. Uh, it's, uh, so, so let's begin with the climate crisis. Um, so it's broadly understood to be caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which trap heat and result in the warming of the planet. So a few, I'm going to make a few remarks about the physical mechanism uh, of global warming. Um, I think it'll then relate to a number of things that um, I, I will talk about and then um, Andres will uh, go into much more detail about. So um, you know, the sun is virtually the Earth's only source of energy. Um, solar radiation reaching the Earth's atmosphere is um, partially reflected, like about 30%, and the remaining is uh, absorbed by the Earth, um, you know, both in the atmosphere and in the uh, sort of the f physical Earth itself. And, um, but in order for the Earth to maintain its temperature, most, uh, you know, the energy has to be radiated back um, out into space. So, um, the, the, you know, the uh, Earth's temperature is much lower than that of the Sun, so the Earth mostly emits radiation in what's called the infrared at you know, lower energies um, and then the uh, solar radiation that we receive. Um, and um, so the, the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere um, consists mostly um, of um, nitrogen and oxygen and, uh, and a bit of argon um, with trace amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor. Um, and, um, so while uh, nitrogen and oxygen are the principal components of uh, the atmosphere, they're largely transparent uh, to both the incoming and outgoing radiation. Um, and, uh, but it's the, uh, these trace uh, gases, um, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide and methane, um, which are really only um, less than a thousandth of the uh, uh, atmosphere, but they're responsible for the, uh, for the greenhouse effect. Um, and uh, you know are responsible for uh, sort of trapping uh, the uh, the heat because they're uh, opaque to the uh, um, um, sort of the infrared spectrum, um, and um, so 
it's 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 interesting that it's like the these very small components of the atmosphere that are responsible for the for this effect. Now, there's a pre-industrial um, uh, um, greenhouse effect, um, and uh, that was uh, you know th uh, th that that was responsible for basically maintaining um, the temperature of the Earth that's conducive to life. So it's very important. Um, but uh, so the pre-industrial value for CO2 was roughly like 288 parts per million, and um, and it's just you know as I was saying like responsible for maintaining a a, a, a nice <laughs> uh, temperature that's conducive to life. Um, but the after the industrial revolution, the CO2 uh, component of the atmosphere has increased drastically, and uh, you know um, and people think that it, it may. Uh, Cross into like 360 parts uh, per million, which would be completely catastrophic. Um, so, uh, you know, with this mechanism, so roughly speaking, we can conclude that the warming of the Earth is principally controlled by uh, two mechanisms: the absorption and reflection of solar radiation, and the degree of opacity of the atmosphere to the infrared spectrum of the radiating Earth uh, due to the presence of these greenhouse gases. Um, so, of course, this is a very uh, highly simplified picture of the climate, um, but remarkably, the um, average warming of the planet since the Industrial Revolution can be roughly explained by this uh, increase, uh, increased presence of greenhouse gases, uh, principally uh, carbon dioxide. The, uh, the focus on global average temperatures does not capture the effects on the local climate, which will vary significantly and depend on geographical details. In fact, the average warming of the planet will result in making certain parts of the, of the planet much colder than they are currently. Um, so th that's important to remember. So we're, we're really uh, talking about sort of the average uh, the temperature rather than the, s the specific sort of um, manifestations of this in different localities. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to move on to point two. So by focusing on the climate alone and restricting ourselves to the increase on average global temperatures, we're really radically truncating our attention from a far wider ecological crisis to a much smaller one. Um, furthermore, like condensing the crisis into a single number, you know, the fraction of carbon in the atmosphere, we're sort of engaged in a kind of, um, sort of what, what people call reification. You know, we're taking a complex, multifaceted issue and, uh, and sort of condensing it into an, uh, to a number, into an abstracted object. Um, and uh, I think that there, there are some perils, um, you know, associated with that. Um, so, and, and, and I think it's important to keep the multifaceted nature of the ecological crisis in mind, um, since uh, th th just addressing that one thing is not going to um, solve <laughs> the much larger problem. Um, so, um, yeah, um, so when you look at, um, so w you know, we're sort of living th through a system of um, an economic system, you know, capitalism, and um, and I think it's the, the priorities of capitalism and the way that it operates that um, th that are, you know, really c uh, determining this um, ecological crisis. And, uh, you know, th uh, one of the things about capitalism is that it treats the Earth as a resource to exploit. And, and s in the last 400 years of its existence, over its dominance, um, th this sort of maniacal rapaciousness has uh, really been the dominant motive force. And the Earth uh, uh, is, uh, in its sort of living and non-living diversity, has become objectified and reduced only um, to its capacity to turn a profit. So th this is sort of like value reduced to quantity alone and undermines the qualitative specificity that uh, gives life its texture, you know, the way that uh, we live it. Um, the consequences of this objectification are, are severe and mark a very distinct break in human history. It's not, you know, a continuation of a, of a you know, time immemorial by any means. Um, so. Uh, next, I want to turn to um, uh, sort of geoengineering and global warming, um, and uh, you know it's related to sort of this um, um, kind of um, this objectification of the um, the ecological crisis into just uh, um, the, the uh, uh, amount of carbon uh, that we have in the atmosphere. So this is my point three. So, uh, um, so geoengineering is the name given to attempts at tackling global warming as a purely physical phenomenon. 
It is, in a sense, an attempt to invent a thermostat for the average global temperature. Um, I will uh, discuss this, the problems with this approach in a, in a few minutes, and Andres will give you a more nuanced picture of geoengineering. But I will just briefly describe the two principal methods of geoengineering and how they relate to the warming mechanism described, that I described earlier. So th the first um, method is what's called uh, solar geoengineering, um, and this is the, the um, so it addresses the problem of warming by uh, proposing methods of basically uh, increasing what's called the albedo of the uh, Earth, its reflectivity. Uh, reflectivity. Um, so, uh, so typical proposals uh, consist of the introduction of aerosols into the upper atmosphere and into the stratosphere, um, increasing cloud cover and changing the reflectivity of oceans. Um, all of this to reflect solar radiation directly back into space and allowing only a fraction of the radiation from reaching the, um, uh, uh, the you know, that would be reached uh, to the Earth and uh, absorbed by the Earth. Um, so that's one mechanism. And, um, and then the second mechanism is uh, carbon capture geoengineering. Um, so th this is an attempt at sort of capturing carbon directly from the atmosphere and removing it to some storage location of some form. Um, so I, I will leave, like, uh, as I was saying, a more detailed description to Andres, but, but, um, but I want to sort of give a, sort of an overarching critique um, of this um, um, mode of um, uh, addressing the problem of addressing climate change. So uh, the first uh, point I want to make is that geoengineering is a very pessimistic attempt at a solution to the climate crisis. It's pessimistic in the sense that it cannot conceive of a world different from the one that we currently live in. So, um, it, so it has nothing to say about the social organization of uh, our society. It has nothing to say about our priorities. Um, and the, the, the pessimism about the immutability of the social world is coupled with a naive optimism and the ability to develop technologies to compensate for the ongoing destruction of our ecology. Um, thus, by asserting the mitigating technologies w will compensate for greenhouse gas, uh, gas emissions on, uh, uh, on, the, on the temperature, it postpones the ending of emissions. Uh, moreover, the promise, unsubstantiated as it is, uh, only relates to the average temperature of the Earth and not to the larger ecological disaster. In fact, all geoengineering projects will be ecologically disastrous. And I'm going to list three ways in which they, they, they are uh, disastrous. Uh, so the first, they shift the de debate away from the goal of achieving zero emissions to something that people now call net zero uh, emissions. Uh, and so that is um, that uh, emissions are allowed to continue um, as long as there are, uh, th there are um, ways of sort of compensating for those emissions, um, you know, in the future. Um, so, uh, so, so b basically, the, the, um, the, the, what you have to do then is you're allowed to, um, to emit as long as you also invest in some technologies that, you know, that purportedly will compensate for these emissions later. Um, so these technologies actually do not exist at this in any sort of climate-relevant form. Um, yeah, yet, um, so, uh, they're, uh, uh, you know, we're allowed to now change sort of the uh, rules of the game. And so it's, it's a bit of a ruse. Um, so and um, so the second way in which I, I think it's uh, ecologically disastrous is, it's, um, is um, you know, I'll t talk about solar geoengineering. So it's basically um, the way that you um, carry out solar engineering is by uh, pollution, right? It, it's, you're polluting the stratosphere, you're, um, uh, you know, increasing cl uh, cloud cover you're, uh, or brightening clouds, and then you um, uh, are polluting oceans all to increase their reflectivity. Um, and uh, all these methods will r result in acid rain, acidification of the oceans, and, uh, and really unforeseeable consequences for weather patterns and for, you know, and for life, really. <laughs> um, and in addition, by blocking the sun, we will be transforming the conditions in which all living beings live in, un uh, in completely unpredictable ways. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it seems to me that it's so committed to, <laughs> you know, continuing with the world as it is that it doesn't matter if, you know, we wake up to, you know, hazy, um, um, you know, skies and, um, um, and, and you know, um, whatever the consequences are as long as we can continue to emit. 
Um, and then the third point I want to make is that uh, carbon capture and removal technologies will basically result in the commandeering of land and nature for the purpose of continuing unsustainable production. And I want to dwell on this, uh, this point a little bit um, because um, I think it, it, it kind of illustrates the ways in which geoengineering is really um, steeped in a colonial mindset. Um, so uh, carbon capture, um, you know, as I was saying, like re requires commandeering land, wh whether for forestation, uh, for laying down pipelines to transport captured carbon, or to store the captured carbon itself, um, you know, in under, uh, you know, underground um, um, uh, spaces. <laughs> Um, the land that it's supposed to be that, that is supposed to be repurposed for carbon capture is considered to be, uh, you know, what you might call a terra nullius, an empty land, with no regard for the life forms that currently thrive there, whether human, animal, plant, or microbial. Um, their loss is not worthy of consideration because they're among uh, the the ungrievable, to use uh, Judith Butler's phrase. Um, this is a colonial ideology in a nutshell. Um, and a version of this um, ex uh, of this future exists now. You know, when you look at the vast network of gas and oil pipelines that are being proposed and are being you know uh, implemented, uh, you know, taking oil from Canada to the U.S. Um, you know, m many of them passing through native lands, and there's um, and uh, you know not only without the consent of those who live there, but uh, through sort of the violent suppression of uh, resistance to these pipelines, as we saw in the case of no DAPL protests, um, you know, under the Obama, Obama regime. Um, and, um, you know, these protests are ongoing now. And um, um, I wanted to say a, a quick word about the, uh, these protests because I feel that one of the ways in which I found those protests really inspiring is that instead of focusing on sort of carbon and climate change, they really were focusing on um, the the destruction of you know their ecosystems of the, you know they would call themselves the water protectors you know they and that's uh, and I think it's very important to uh, leave sort of the abstractions of uh, you know the way in which uh, sometimes climate is talked about into really um, sort of very concrete ways that it affects us and um, I, I I thought that was uh, really powerful and uh, of course. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're, um, uh, and it was really inspired by th their um, persistence a against all the incredible violence that was uh, uh, used against them. Um, and so carbon capture will impose a new set of such pip pipelines to supposedly neutralize the damage of the pipelines going in the other direction, right? So, um, so we have to be clear that the pipeline infrastructure will not be passing through Malibu, <laughs> but through tracts of land that are considered uninhabited because the lives of those who live there do not matter to capital. Um, so finally, all geoengineering projects are being pursued by private corporations while being supported by public money. And none of these projects have to succeed in order for the corporations to make profits. Many, if not most, of the geoengineering corporations are subsidiaries of fossil fuel companies like Shell, ExxonMobil, and Chevron. These corporations have found a way to not only continue to profit from fossil fuel production, but also to profit from pretending to undo the damage they're causing. And um, my, my point four. Uh, so I, I want to uh, now leave geoengineering um, aside and uh, and ask what kinds of things can we do now? Um, you know, for a long time we've been hampered uh, by basically uh, these twin imperatives. Like one is to counter climate change denialism, and the other is to uh, maintain the current way of organizing society. That is to say, not think about <laughs> how we could change uh, the way that we live, but uh, you know, uh, basically, um, yeah, just c continuing. Um, so th both of these imperatives have uh, sort of really caged our imaginations. Uh, you know, to to the continuation of the world as it is right now, and not to try to actively imagine um, and uh, and uh, and try to build a world that you know allows us to live fulfilling lives. Um, uh, and um, so, when, so when discussing technological solutions, I think we should really begin with the technologies that already exist, uh, rather than you know pegging our hopes on some kind of future <laughs> miraculous uh, invention. Um, so, I mean, I, I just wanted to make a few very basic proposals because I think they're very simple to think about, but for some reason they're not pursued. <laughs> 
So uh, the, the, the first one, I, I think, is that if we made uh, public transportation completely free, so in New York, um, you know, all subways, buses, Long Island Railroad, Metro North trains, if we just made them completely free, um, you know, I don't, I, it, it would reduce drastically the amount of um, uh, traffic, you know, c uh, individual car traffic. Um, and similarly, you know, we can pursue s similar um, public transportation projects in other places as well, um, which are, you know, completely free. Um, and this is well within the, po uh, the realm of possibility. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, 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 and they, um, like when you look at sort of Biden's um, policies, like he wants to, you know, set aside, um, you know, I think literally trillions of dollars into, you know, developing nuclear um, power and so on. I mean, that could easily, some fraction of it could go into, you know, making public transportation free. Um, and, you know, we also have to make uh, public transportation accessible. Um, so that it covers, you know, a much larger area, and um, you know, and also serves people with disabilities. Like, you know, my subway stop, um, it, uh, you, you can't use it unless you c can go up and down stairs, um, and uh, it's a, a terrible shame. Um, and, and you know, something something should be done about that. Um, again, like very simple technologies, um, and then um, I, I think that it's also important that you know th that. Um, Commuting to work, for instance, has become like th this thing that's completely the responsibility of the employee. Um, when you have um, big um, uh, corporations or even you know like you know relatively big uh, companies, uh, they should be made responsible for uh, you know providing uh, transportation and also for paying people while they're be being you know commuting because there's this whole part of our lives that's just taken up by the commute <laughs> you know from home to work. Um, and then back again, um, and it's completely uh, on our dime. Like we have to buy the cars, we have to maintain the cars, we have to pay for gas, we have to do all of those things that um, uh, really uh, are just free um, for the uh, uh, for the employer. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and then, you know, I think we should, um, uh, the city should provide emission-free transportation for, you know, people who need to go to medical visits and so on. And um, finally, I, I think we should just ban <laughs> private jets. I mean, what, what, um, and, and, you know, that's uh, in some sense an anti-technological um, um, move. Uh, get rid of those technologies, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, but instead of adopting very simple, obvious steps, uh, you know, what we see in New York City is completely go going in the opposite direction. What we have is, um, you know, the, the increases in subway fares um, and, and the, the um, uh, you know, the, the deployment of, uh, you know, cops in subway stations, you know, to prevent uh, what they like to call fare evasion, um, you know, uh, and... Uh, and so instead of making it free, they're making it to this punitive thing where if you, tr um, if you can't afford to take the, the subway, you will be, uh, you know, um, uh, you will have to, there will be consequences. Um, I mean, instead, we should just lay off these cops and use the saved money to make public transportation free. Um, and if we obviate the need for privately owned cars, uh, whether gas-fueled or electric, <laughs> I mean, I'll say, um, you know, the, the, it it will free up a lot of space because, you know, mo most of the, um, you know, if you look at the way cars are used, you use it for maybe a, an hour or two, <laughs> you know, during the day. The rest of the time it's just parked on the street. It's just taking up <laughs> real estate, right? In a, in a city where um, housing is uh, so scarce, so unaffordable, um, if that space was opened up, we could, uh, you know, do all kinds of things with it. Housing, recreation, you know, any number of things. Um, so I think we need to think um, in those terms. And many of these things can be done literally overnight. I mean, you can make the subways free overnight. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and I think it's what it requires is, is the will. Um, Okay, so the, the next point I wanted to make is um, about uh, sort of re renewable energy sources. So, um, so um, I, it's my view that you know when when it comes to renewable energies energy sources, we should not uh, they should not come at the expense of more eco destruction and loss of habitat. Um, I think one has to be very careful about that. 
Um, and there are um, ways of, you know, there are simple ways of using solar and wind energy that do not require that it first be converted into electricity. Um, you know, f so I mean, uh, just to give you one example, which is um, pretty obvious, you know, for much of the life of humanity, like, you know, we use solar and wind energy to uh, dry, you know, our clothes, you know, la laundry, um, you know, by just simply putting them out in those elements. But, but uh, you know, um, uh, and we, we could do that, and that's not a, a technology that needs to be mediated even by the state. It can be something that, uh, you know, we, we can do sort of locally. Um, and, you know, there are other things, uh, similar things that we can do where you directly use the um, energy from the sun uh, and wind. Um, and, um, you know, w during Occupy, uh, 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 Occupy Wall Street, um, you know, one of my favorite <laughs> technologies, so to speak, was this, um, um, you know, bike that they'd set up uh, where uh, it was just a regular bike, but it was set up as sort of an exercise bike, and then you could, uh, and you could basically hook it up to a dynamo and then charge your phone by, you know, um, uh, yeah, by pedaling. Um, and I thought that was great, you know, and, and um, there are things like that we can, we can do. Um, and um, so we, we and, and you know similarly, I think we need to think about ways of just using directly solar and geothermal energy to heat our homes and so on. Um, and uh, and I think there's a related point to that, which is that I think we we really look with disdain on people who came before us as being somehow uh, naive or not very sophisticated. And similarly, we look at people who um, you know come from different cultures as being sort of primitive in some sense. And so we don't really try to learn from them how they lived, how they l survived the, in these elements, you know, <laughs> that um, uh, and, and that we can now only conceive of um, surviving in through. Um, you know, air conditioning or whatever, <laughs> you know, so uh, I think we really need to kind of learn from them. Um, and uh, so the next point I want to make is that, uh, you know, there are lots of um, ecological, uh, ecologically viable communities that have been born out of struggles against environmental destruction. Among them, of course, like is the, uh, the, uh, the, the no dapple uh, water protectors. Uh, similarly, there's the, the, the Zad community in France, which was formed um, by occupying the site where an unneeded airport was supposed to be built. And then uh, the, o the current occupiers of Stop Cop City in Atlanta are another example, as well as the occupiers of the Hambach uh, Forest in uh, Germany, um, which is, um, you know, which, um, they're occupying it to prevent sort of uh, coal mining taking place in that area. Um, and I think we really need to learn from them and to l learn to, uh, what they're doing is they're developing a relationship to nature rather than thinking of nature as this object on which we act. And I think that's a really, um, um, uh, you know, important um, w sort of way of sort of transforming our relationship to nature. Um, and then uh, finally, <laughs> and this is my final thing, I, I want to t sort of touch on the culture in which we live. So the climate crisis is, you know, completely undeniable, yet there is very little that is being done uh, about it, and it just seems uh, insane, right? I mean, it seems uh, like suicidal, um, um, you know, behavior. Um, and so, uh, so I want to uh, turn to um, the analysis that uh, Walter Benjamin uh, uh, had of uh, fascism, and he um, he said that he, he noted that fascism sort of aestheticized politics, so that instead of it being a meaningful activity um, to achieve something, it became sort of a ritual um, practice. Um, and he wrote um, that, that humanity, which in hum Homer's time was an object of contemplation for the Olympian gods, now is one for itself. Its self-alienation has reached such a degree that it can experience its own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. And this is the situation of politics, which fascism is rendering aesthetic. So what uh, Benjamin said about fascism it also seems to be true about neoliberal capitalism. Um, we're watching the destruction of our planet as an aesthetic experience. Um, you know, and one expression of this um, <coughs> aestheticization was on display at the UN Climate Action Summit at which uh, Greta Thunberg uh, spoke um, by invitation. Um, so she made the points, you know, she has made uh, many times before that the world leaders, um, you know, in her audience and elsewhere 
had failed humanity, and her message was raised, uh, received with great applause, as if she had delivered a message praising them rather than denouncing them. Um, and so meaning and action appear to no longer have a place in the theater of politics, um, which is now completely dominated by meaningless rhetoric and ritual. Um, and and uh, that's sort of my closing point. Um, but I do want to end with, end with um, uh, a quotation from uh, uh, W.H. Auden. Uh, he wrote in 1937 a pamphlet, uh, you know, a poem which was produced as a pamphlet uh, about Spain and the uh, civil war that was going on there, the Spanish Revolution. And uh, it was basically an, ex an exhortation to join the fight. A and he, 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 he said, um, so I'll just quote him. This is the very final uh, stanza. It says, the stars are dead, the animals will not look. We are left alone with our day and the time is short. And history to the defeated may say alas, but cannot help nor pardon. And that's all. Thanks so much, Ansar. That was really fascinating. Um, if I stand up, are people going to be able to see me online? OK. Um, I'm going to stand up because I'm using slides. And um, my presentation is largely providing an account of the history of geoengineering and CO2 disposal, um, starting from their origin in Cold War era technological enthusiasm through various stages of conceptual development the ways that these technologies have shaped um, views on mitigation and risk and then uh, avenues forward. Uh, it's a little bit more of a historical um, analysis. Um, I'll talk a bit about the historical function and, and um, political function of these technologies uh, and their continued importance, I think, in several different lights. Um, and I'll end by sharing some of my takeaways about the importance of a really robust fossil fuel phase out among other kinds of social and ecological, um, sorry, economical transformations. Um, yeah, that's the outline. So um, Ansar spoke a bit about this, what is geoengineering? And I'm gonna also start there. Geoengineering as a concept is a little fuzzy. Different people define it in different ways. It's also been defined differently over time. But I think that this diagram and definition is probably the most common. Um, this is from an article written by David Keith, who's a well-known proponent of geoengineering. Um, and the way that he breaks it down uh, is that mitigation involves human actions that change climate. Geoengineering acts directly on the climate system and adaptation are the kinds of interventions that um, are sort of a response. So mitigation, that's clear. I mean, that involves things like renewable energy, energy efficiency, and other things that reduce um, energy consumption. Building denser, more walkable cities, public transportation, all of that cuts down on energy usage, cuts down on emissions. Geoengineering can include solar radiation management. Um, through this definition, it would also include CO2 removal from the atmosphere because that is acting directly on the concentration of gases in the atmosphere. Um, adaptation uh, involves seawalls and um, things like that to shield against impacts. Technologies themselves um, can fall into different buckets, and the one that I'm going to talk a lot about today, um, I often refer to as CO2 disposal because I think it's more evocative of the way that this technology is viewed and used. Um, but this is also referred to as industrial carbon management, carbon capture and storage. This portfolio of technologies for capturing, transporting, and storing CO2, depending on context, it can be considered mitigation. For example, if you're using that technology um, at a power plant or a refinery to prevent emissions from entering the atmosphere. In other contexts, it's considered geoengineering in that this suite of technologies is needed for CO2 removal. Um, Cold War technological enthusiasm really set the stage for early geoengineering and CO2 disposal proposals. Um, so cloud seeding um, was discovered at the General Electric Research Labs in the 40s. 
Um, this is a kind of technology that allows um, engineers to have some degree of control over where and when it rains. And the initial uh, interest in this technology was commercial. It was intended to be used for agriculture. And um, it was apparently very widespread. So I've read that in the US in 1951, commercial interests were targeting an area equal to 14% of the lower 48 states, which is much more widespread than I had realized before getting deeper into this research. At the same time, the USSR had a climate and weather modification program, also looking at agricultural interests. And in addition to cloud seeding, the USSR was actually persistently interested in melting the Arctic Ocean as a way of raising temperatures in Siberia and the northern parts of the USSR, um, again, for agriculture. But as the Cold War gathered steam, um, the US military started to pump funding into these kinds of um, weather and climate modification um, technologies. And in um, 1966, the US actually began leveraging cloud seeding as a war tool in Vietnam. Climate and weather modification fell out of style after the mid-1970s um, for a combination of reasons, but partly because um, of public outcry over its usage in Vietnam. Also, it didn't work that well. Another important technology that laid the groundwork for geoengineering is enhanced oil recovery. Um, enhanced oil, oil recovery is a way of extending the producing lifespan of oil fields. Um, and the way that it works is you inject CO2 down into the ground in um, an old well. That CO2 um, increases pressure and basically forces more oil out. And um, you know, it's not that dissimilar from fracking. Enhanced oil recovery has been going on for a very long time. Chevron first used it in 1972. Um, and there was a boom, uh, I think, in the 80s for enhanced oil recovery. And there has been a major build out of pipelines for this way of extending the lifetime of aging wells um, simply because it returns more profits to big oil. Um, the CO2 for this um, approach has traditionally come from naturally occurring underground CO2 deposits, um, which makes it quite different from some of the proposals today, um, where captured CO2 at a power plant um, could be stored underground or used for enhanced oil recovery. Energy system modeling is a little different, but plays a big role in the talk that I'll be giving. Um, Basic macroeconomic energy system uh, models originated in the late 1950s, um, but over time, energy system modeling has uh, really grown much more complex. And um, at its core, this kind of modeling involves a simple numerical approach to representing energy demand and costs. Um, Again, over time, this sort of modeling would evolve into um, a tool that is used for understanding and evaluating climate policy. The models that are used today are called integrated assessment models. They are coupled energy and environmental system models um, that include various assumptions about growing energy demand, the mix of energy sources that could supply that demand, um, and often, again, they involve an economy element, um, an energy element, which is really key, and usually a land system model as well, um, because biofuels and bioenergy can play a major role in this kind of modeling. Now I'm gonna move on to techno solutions as a response to global warming. Um, this was first proposed in the 70s, um, and solar radiation management to counteract warming um, was proposed in 1974 by the climatologist Mikhail Budaiko, um, who was also actually an important scientist in understanding Arctic sea ice dynamics. Um, and his research suggested that humans could counteract global warming by burning sulfur in the stratospheric atmosphere. 
Um, he actually just predicted that you, know, you could run a few flights per day and that that would be sufficient. Um, in 1976, the IASA engineer, Cesar Marchetti, suggested that you could capture CO2 emissions at the smokestack and dispose of it by injecting it into Mediterranean outflow currents into the Atlantic as a way of disposing of carbon dioxide. Um, so it's worth noting that these kinds of technologies started um, as freewheeling speculation at a time of rising environmental concern. Uh, a key aspect of them is that they allow for fossil fuel exploitation to continue unchecked. Another key aspect of these arguably is hubris. Um, they seemingly reflect the ethos of weather modification, much more so than that of Rachel Carson style US environmentalism, which was also um, you know, very relevant at the time, and which had achieved, among other victories, a nationwide ban on DDT. Um, these concepts in the 70s were not subject to much fanfare, um, but in time they would capture the attention of a connected network of corporations, governments, and academic institutions. So in this next section, I'm going to talk about early acceptance of these technologies and the way that that may have shaped perspectives on mitigation. Um, so by the 80s and 90s, there's a clear scientific consensus about the dangers of global warming. Most corporations knew about it. Some of them had been deeply involved with the actual science of understanding global warming. So um, for example, um, the American Petroleum Institute uh, was deeply involved with early climate research. Exxon knew about a lot of the climate research in the 80s, if not earlier. But against the backdrop of conservative politics at home and energy market deregulation abroad, these companies had really little motivation but to continue business as usual. Governments were also pretty deeply dependent on expanding fossil fuel production. Um, which had facilitated the economic and imperialist expansion of Western powers from the Industrial Revolution onward. So what factors can really explain the boom that I'll get to in carbon management research that started mainly in the 90s? One answer is that corporations were spooked by prospective energy and environmental policies. Um, the first carbon taxes were enacted in 1990 and 1991, and Norway's carbon tax was actually so high, which was $41 a ton in that year, that the state-owned oil company Equinor um, considered CO2 scrubbing and disposal to be the solution, and that's where we got the first um, actual commercial application of carbon capture. For its part, US corporations and trade groups strongly opposed even the most basic of environmental policies at this time, um, but at the same time as they were funding climate denial and delay, um, they were actively um, posturing as the key to unlocking global climate solutions. Oops. So um, the carbon management boom began mainly in the 90s, and universities, research agencies, and corporations hailing um, from the US, Japan, and several European countries worked in very close collaboration um, and there was a series of international conferences on carbon removal that kicked off uh, in 1992, biannual conferences. The excitement around CO2 disposal, um, in my view, was basically a triple win for polluting industry. Um, it enhanced the appearance of industry-driven environmental in innovation, um, positioning climate mitigation as a technology-dependent uh, issue and reinforcing corporate access to research funding um, and universities, all while leaving the actual driver of fossil fuel production and consumption unchecked. And at this time in the 90s, there were fairly progressive and stringent proposals that were being considered, perhaps not fully undermining fossil fuel capitalism, um, but um, they were serious proposals in the US and in Europe. Um, one example that I've done some research into that I find fascinating is direct ocean CO2 disposal. Um, this was a prominent idea that was considered for a while and it's no longer really in the running. 
Um, but the idea here is that you can dispose of carbon dioxide by injecting it directly into the ocean, either by pipeline or by sort of dissolving it. And um, this came out of the sort of freewheeling speculation ide ideation of the um, techno solution boom, you might say. Until 1997, most of it was hypothetical, was crude engineering analyses, but um, at a certain point, um, MIT's Howard Herzog, who's still a very prominent voice in these kinds of discussions today, um, won $4 million worth of funding from um, the U.S. government and, from, uh, and, and other sources as well to conduct field experiments into his idea of direct ocean CO2 disposal. So this project was celebrated as a major environmental achievement at the third conference of parties, um, UN climate conference. And with several phases planned, it would have culminated in a two week long CO2 dump into the ocean, if not for being opposed um, by local organizers. There was a coalition against CO2 dumping formed that involved um, you know, different groups kind of working in coalition. Um, these members opposed dumping CO2 into Kona waters for several different reasons, not the least of which was distrust of mainlanders basically coming in to um, their, their lands and their waters and, um, and sort of intruding. So this opposition also was linked to Hawaiian sovereignty and indigenous rights movements. Um, some were opposed to direct ocean CO2 disposal for religious reasons, and some uh, even at this time thought that it was a distraction from the hard work of phasing out fossil fuels. So the campaign was successful. Um, yeah. If, I mean, the environmental concerns were, were part of this opposition as well, yeah. Um, I think another a reason for this experiment was also to evaluate the local impacts of CO2 disposal into the ocean. So there had been lab experiments um, to sort of understand the ocean acidification that could be associated with CO2 disposal. And um, the research team concluded that they were n uh, you know, not serious enough to prevent this from moving forward. Arguable, you know, whether you want to agree or disagree with their analysis, but their um, they wanted to, to bring it to a field test. So the opposition was successful. The project was canceled. Um, the organizers tried to move it to Norway. They got a permit, and Norway's environmental minister um, withdrew the permit, and the whole thing fell apart. Nonetheless, the project lead, this guy Howard Herzog, um, goes on to found a really major research lab at MIT that for a very long time, hosted all of these fossil fuel companies. So his, you know, one of his first major forays into field experiments was a failure. He was the host of um, the third international conference on carbon dioxide removal in MIT in 1996. Um, still a very prominent voice, but um, despite this kind of failure of his research approach and experiment, he got a lot, a lot of support from the fossil fuel industry later on. That's just kind of a fun case study. Bioenergy carbon capture and storage um, is a little different. I think it plays a more central role in what we're dealing with today when it comes to understanding um, technologies as a response to the climate crisis. Bioenergy carbon capture and storage is considered a way of drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere because um, bioenergy, biomass, is typically considered carbon neutral. Um, because for every uh, plant you burn, you're planting a new one that needs to be harvested. And when you add carbon capture and storage to that, the idea is that it's actually net negative um, because you're both growing plants, harvesting them, and then preventing that and bur burying the CO2. Um, according to IASA's Michael Obersteiner, um, integrated assessment models were incapable of simulating pathways below 450 parts per million before the invention of Beck. So you know, there, there are a few different originators for this technology um, who were bouncing the idea of Beck's around the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, they had fascinating motivations. One of them thought that Beck's was a way of actually increasing the profits of um, the commercial paper and timber industry. Um, but um, this, I think, to me, sticks out the most as, as a reason for the invention of Beck's. Um, 
And like Ansar said, uh, before you know, in, in the pre-industrial area, uh, we were at 288 or something ppm. So the fact that these models could not actually simulate um, pathways below 450, I think, is actually quite notable. And the sort of invention of BEX as a solution to that is really representative of the problem. Um, because these models were really inflexible, um, they're very simplified representations that essentially depend on, um, th they're hard coded to require continuous economic growth. Um, so before long, BEX would actually be integrated into integrated assessment models that are used for policy decision making. Um, that's you know, one of the ways that I think it um, ended up shaping views on mitigation the most. So I may have partly given this away, but yeah, the question, how did geoengineering and CO2 disposal concepts influence perspectives on mitigation? Um, I think that the early acceptance of these technologies, and especially their usage in integrated assessment models, served to basically exonerate free market capitalism and quell a lot of the urgency around different kinds of solutions and the need to phase out emissions and fossil fuels. Um, Again, these integrated assessment models that used BECs um, were basically hard-coded to require continuous growth. They framed ever-increasing consumption per capita as an inherent and unchangeable good. Um, they're incapable of simulating a really wide range of different solutions, um, social and infrastructural transitions, um, and these models are basically black boxes. So the way they interact with these techno solutions, I think, is really pretty key. And BEX was an escape valve that allowed the fantasy of endless growth to uh, coexist with achieving climate goals, at least in the view of these tools. And all of this was seemingly endorsed, albeit with caveats, by trustworthy research institutions, private universities, and to a certain extent by the IPCC. Um, you know, th this question I think is also interesting because I, none of us have a full answer. There's still, I think, an unanswered question, which is whether things would have turned out any differently if BEX were not proposed the way that it was. And considering the overwhelming amount of climate denial and disinformation churned out by the fossil fuel industry anyway, and the sheer amount of influence they have over politics in terms of the money they spend, it's really hard to say. Um, I have thought to myself that you know, the infiltration of CO2 removal and geoengineering into the public consciousness um, may have you know, had really major effects, but it's kind of all speculation because this is in some ways a pretty small part of how the fossil fuel industry has exerted its influence and made its own narrative the dominating one. Um, the third piece of my presentation is about the conceptual development of these ideas versus real world implementation. Uh, techno solutions, including but not limited to solar radiation management and BEX, um, began facing resistance from people's movements and NGOs pretty much as soon as they entered into public consciousness. Um, starting in 1999, Greenpeace was instrumental in some of the efforts to block CO2 disposal. Um, in 2009 and in 2010, after other forms of resistance, um, there were major statements released by indigenous peoples and Global South delegates um, that came out of, uh, for example, the Cochabamba's People's Agreement. Um, and if anyone here is not familiar with that, I would suggest looking it up. This was a major conference held in Bolivia in 2010 with delegates from people's movements around the world, the largest of its kind maybe ever. Um, and the agreement that was drafted here is almost an alternative vision to the Paris Agreement, one that is much more centered on living within the confines of nature and rejecting um, capitalist uh, ways of, of framing um, ever-increasing growth. Um, so this, the, one of the you know, agreements that came out of this was an explicit rejection of geoengineering and biofuels as false solutions. Um, and this kind of opposition is frequently situated in a broader critique of capitalist models and its many harms, highlighting as negative, for example, the logic of commodification, which prioritizes profit over health and well-being, the destruction of culture, nature, and biodiversity, and capitalism's propensity to create racist and classist sacrifice zones. 
Um, so as an alternative, many of these opponents call for system change and living within the limits of nature. At the same time, or perhaps after all of that was happening, the shift toward the one and a half degree goal that was sort of initiated with the signing of the Paris Agreement cast a major spotlight on the role of VEX, carbon removal, and CCS in climate mitigation scenarios. So I think, you know, there are so many different conversations around these technologies happening. There are t the conversations in policy circles informed by the research um, and I think that the sort of grassroots opposition resistance enters into this discussion, but it's the shift to one and a half degrees that, um, from my experience working with these models, um, I think really casts a spotlight on some of the most problematic uh, parts. And here you can just see um, scenarios in the IPCC's special report on global warming of one and a half degrees and just the enormous amount of VEX and CO2 removal that they rely on. Um, I'm trying to remember like exactly how much it is, uh, but the, the scale of, of CO2 removal envisioned by these one and a half degree pathways, um, I think can be similar to all of the emissions from the power sector from every country combined except for China today. Um, so it's like an absolutely enormous, unthinkable infrastructural build out. And at a certain point, um, I think the scientists working on that um, did kind of awaken to this political reality. Um, so what I've experienced, I worked with these scenarios and on the kind of like science policy um, interface for, uh, for a long time, not a long time, for like four years, um, is, is that researchers were increasingly focusing attention on um, some of the biophysical, legal, and social interactions connected to these technologies. Um, and, and after the special report on, on one and a half degrees, I think there was more attention on scenarios that achieve the one and a half degree goal with really sharp energy demand cuts. Um, you know, even in, in very recent years, this has continued to evolve, and the IEA's Fatih Baral um, and many others have really emphatically rejected the illusion that CO2 disposal can allow for business as usual. Um, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, is um, a very conservative intergovernmental organization that for a very long time has been trumpeting continuous growth for fossil fuels. And the fact that their director has come out and basically said that this is a fantasy that the oil and gas companies need to turn away from is really notable and I think reflective of the entire research community um, taking a much more active and political stance in certain ways. Um, I also think geoengineering debates are increasingly happening in view of the public. I mean, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have this talk, um, but there have been letters signed by scientists both in favor of and opposing solar radiation management um, experiments, uh, for, for example, um, some calling for a moratorium um, and other prominent scientists uh, saying that it's, it's needed. Um, I'll move on to the next slide here. Real world CCS implementation has been highly problematic. Um, so there has been quite a lot of sort of, uh, you know, theoretical academic uh, energy on these kinds of technologies. There's also been some real world implementation that we should take into account when we're thinking about the future. Um, I just listed a few ways that the real world implementation has been problematic. Um, for one, most captured CO2 is still used for enhanced oil, oil recovery, and um, regardless of that, it gets, um, you get tax credits for it in the U.S. Um, big oil uses carbon capture pipe dreams to greenwash, so these companies and um, Dubai hosting the Conference of Parties uh, right now um, use this sort of fantasy of these technologies as a way of saying that they can keep drilling for new fossil fuels. Current policies act as a subsidy to the fossil fuel industry, even in terms of subsidies for direct air capture, because often, as Ansar mentioned, you have the same fossil fuel companies that are reaping um, the benefits of these, of these tax credits, um, and they are sometimes reinvesting that into their fossil fuel business. 
Um, it's even more explicit in terms of companies that might apply carbon capture to a coal power plant. Um, that might be a piece of infrastructure that otherwise would not be profitable, but with these tax credits, it could uh, continue to be used for more years. Um, this is more theoretical, but um, I think big oil should not be trusted to navigate social and environmental risks. So if you are someone who thinks we will need CCS, um, big oil is not the right actor to do it um, because there are real social and environmental risks and they cannot be trusted. Uh, and many of the largest projects that have um, come to fruition for CCS have overpromised and underdelivered. Lots of projects have been canceled, some have not, but even the ones that have not have largely underdelivered on promises. And this is the CEO of Occidental Petroleum, um, one of the oil companies that's been most actively supporting direct air capture. Um, this is a quote of hers from an oil conference recently, um, really laying it all out that the industry sees these technologies as a way to continue to operate for the next um, many decades. So this brings me to the question of avenues forward. First, talking about climate urgency and climate reality, the remaining carbon budget to keep warming below one and a half degrees with a 50% likelihood is around 200 gigatons. So this is equal to around five years of current emissions. I think it's really hard to understate the urgency of that. And like, this is only a 50% likelihood of hitting the one and a half degree target of, or of holding warming below it. So this needs to be better known. And I think the impacts of one and a half degree of warming also need to be much better known. Um, every tenth of a degree matters, especially considering uncertainty regarding actual climate sensitivity and feedbacks. There's research showing that certain tipping points may have been exceeded. Um, and, uh, you know, exceeding one and a half degrees, the longer that we stay there, um, the, the worse these risks become. <clears throat> and I think that raises some really serious questions because um, five years is not a lot of time. Um, it's not only local changes, it's not only domestic changes that are needed to reach this goal, it's international changes not only the US, so, so within our realm of influence, there are pretty severe limitations toward what we can do to achieve this goal. Um, clearly, the first avenue forward is a robust fossil fuel phase out without loopholes. Um, phasing out fossil fuels is the most obvious, the most certain way of achieving our climate goals. Um, there, is, there is simply no replacement for it, and it addresses a whole lot of issues at once. There are the climate issues, there are other ecological issues, there are social issues. There's a lot of research showing that the fossil fuel industry and the oil industry often undermines and erodes democracy. Um, this will also have major public health benefits, um, environmental justice benefits, with millions of lives saved due to cleaner air. Um, there's a need for far-reaching transitions across all sectors and systems. Some of them were mentioned by Ansar in terms of increasing the usage of public transportation and displacing um, the usage of personal automobiles. Um, another big one here in New York City is the building sector. The building sector is the most polluting sector in the city. Um, so driving those emissions and energy usage down is really key. I think that in terms of the size of the carbon budget and the kinds of transitions and transformations that are needed, um, it's important to think creatively, not only about individual interventions, so for example, um, electrifying your home, but also about changes in urban planning um, that could lead to better urban density, um, for example. Um, I think that uh, you know there, there are kind of simple creative solutions that Ansar mentioned that maybe we feel are needed and that have been proposed, um, such as not only banning private jets, but actually imposing flight moratoria or pauses until we um, have some more action on reducing emissions, especially in the global north. Um, another sort of perspective I'll throw out is the need to learn from socialist victories. It's easy, I think, to get stuck in 
some of the theory, um, but we do have socialist victories to learn from, especially here in New York. The Build Public Renewables Act being passed um, is maybe one of the most important ones um, where uh, New York State has been given the authority and indeed the um, obligation to build out renewable energy to serve the state's needs, um, which would have been unthinkable a decade ago. Um, and the last thing I'll say here is the need to hold space for changing materialist concerns. And this kind of links back to the size of the carbon budget and um, the, the five years of current emissions that we have left. Um, I do think that um, often on the left and in progressive spaces, there is a tendency to frame the technology as the problem. And I did just lay out a sort of presentation about much of what makes the technology and especially its roots problematic. But moving forward, um, I think the central conflict is that such technologies, um, one, are under big oil's control, um, and two, kind of the policies that have been proposed um, are extremely problematic. So big oil is using carbon capture as a cudgel to prolong fossil fuel production, which gets us even further from our climate goals. I think this ensures that we'll breach the one and a half degree target, but it also erodes support for these kinds of technological interventions, um, which might be needed to save lives. There might need to be some kind of trade-off. Um, and there were, I think, earlier debates regarding funding to climate adaptation, um, which have largely fallen by the wayside as it's become clear that we actually need climate adaptation to survive and to mitigate risk. Um, I think today there is a lot of um, sort of rejection of CO2 disposal, CO2 removal. I think it's from a good place, um, but we might reach a point in time, I think we will reach a point in time where we have no choice. Um, so for, for those of us who are experts, who, are, who follow the science closely, um, I think it's important to be clear that um, there are some luxuries that we do not have anymore. I think the luxury of sort of picking and choosing between technologies um, <coughs> has, has passed. I think that window is gone and um, there's a need to kind of make the best of what we have. <coughs> so with CCS, um, it's clear that it does us absolutely no use without a fossil fuel phase out. Um, but it's also clear that um, we will not get a fossil fuel phase out quickly enough. Um, and even if we did, there is some usage for, for um, techno solutions, but not techno solutionism, to bring global warming back down and to help ameliorate some of the, the worst effects. Um, of course, there are so many questions that you could raise about that conclusion, and um, we'll probably have some time to discuss. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you both so much for those um, really in-depth presentations. I would show you my notebook. It makes no sense right now because <laughs> of my uh, chicken scratch. Um, so this was great. I really loved, I mean, how both of you really drew in I think Ansari said specifically, like, leave the abstraction out, uh, like, to kind of really draw on a materialist understanding of the cri climate crisis and the different ways in which it manifests. So thank you so much, uh, truly, for that. Um, and I'm also putting you both in office because we need free public transit ASAP. Mm -hmm. um, so I also do want to open it up for, we have about maybe 30 or so minutes for discussion. So whether anyone wants to pose questions to Ansar and Andres or um, any general reflections you'd like to share, there's space for that. Also for folks online, if you have any questions related to the presentations, feel free to drop them in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, my question is for the uh, last presenter. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names already. But um, I just wanted to um, ask um, if you've had thoughts about um, all of the models that we're operating with have been created by scientists employed by these uh, uh, coal producers. And I, I wonder if it's possible, and like 
fossil fuel producers. And I wonder if it's possible to disentangle um, science's relationship with the industrial revolution and um, uh, just really, because we're going to need like these these problems that have been created out of industrialization, uh, we're, we're sort of um, left with having to use uh, scientific method to to um, deal with. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, th yeah, that was great. Um, thank you both for um, latest presentation. And I guess I can speak from personal experience. You know, right after I finished my PhD, I spent a little bit of time um, in the seaweed farming industry, which I guess you could say is a subset of um, the biomass carbon capture. And I definitely see these contradictions of people that w want to, you know, get find a way out of the carbon. I'm sorry, the climate crisis, but are. Um, still stuck using like cap, cap rooted in capitalist driven ends. So, I guess as someone who just kind of got out, I definitely would want to hear more about like how can we bring people who are in those in sustainability geoengineering industries? How can we radicalize them, develop their political consciousness, and and say you know we we got to make sure that the science and technology that we do, even though we don't really have a choice, we got to make sure that. That the work that you're doing is get actually actively geared towards, you know, getting free from like big oil and all these other, um, getting out of capitalism essentially. Thank you. Hi, my name is Akiko, and uh, thank you so much for the valuable talk. And I was very surprised and. Very impressed. And the first question is: uh, This is United States, so it's hard to be socialist that much. But at the recent news, I noticed that the New York City government started to take a congestion tax, whoever driving into the city. So that I, I can see that socialistic idea is actually you know being you know utilized. But uh, we don't get to the point that like uh, if we use public transportation, we should get a refund or something. Like a, because it, if it's completely free, it's not really competitive and enthusiastic, and you might also get like a, a bunch of crime in a subway, and that's not what we want. So you know, the more you use uh, the public transportation in a man, you know peaceful way, you know we can make money out of it or something. That will be like a, our you know capitalistic way of life, I think. Then another question is uh, China. Uh, it was excluded from the CO2 uh, the movement, but uh, I had, I'm not sure if I'm do, like, uh, getting a, uh, the correct information or not, but in China they have like a gigantic windmill system in the air and capturing all the carbon dioxide by you know, running the machine. And I don't know how they convert the carbon dioxide into something else, but that's what I had. So I think that's it, thank you. Yeah, I can start. Um, <clears throat> so on the first question, um, I don't think that scientists' role can be disentangled from history, but I don't think that means that scientists can't um, take the positions that they need to in the current political context. Um, I think that understanding scientists' role in history and understanding the history of techno solutions is empowering. Um, and when it comes to the actual usage of tools like integrated assessment models, I've seen a lot of work happening around, you know, alternative scenario frameworks, ways to try and make these more useful and relevant. Um, I don't think integrated assessment models are uh, really a great tool for organizers. Um, I have also seen uh, researchers creating more bottom-up scenarios that I think are much more useful for activism in that they lay out realistically what would be needed to achieve the one and a half degree goal 
without any kind of reliance on technologies. And sometimes these are framed as more utopian scenarios. The folks who create them might not have the funding from big oil that um, other research groups have, so they might be coarser in granularity. But one example, um, <clears throat> there was a roadmap created for the UK to get to real zero. Um, might have been tied to Oxford, interestingly enough. But the lead author of that roadmap, um, I think, has been a really productive spokesperson for um, the kinds of more radical near-term interventions that are needed, for example, um, imposing moratoria on flights, or at least local flights. Do you want to address the other? The, sec the second or, question. Or, yeah. um, okay, the second question was. Do you, I'm trying to jog my memory. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can um, say something about that. Um, yeah, you were, um, the question was about how to draw people away from sort of geoengineering and develop more of a socialist perspective. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that, well, I, I guess the first thing I would say about this is that, you know, I think um, most people who go into it ha are, have very good intentions. You know, they want to do something about the, the crisis. Um, the, but um, I think that part of the problem, uh, I think, is that we are, um, you know, as I m mentioned in my talk, I think that when we talk about um, carbon just as this isolated thing, we, um, you know, uh, remove it from the larger, um, you know, ecological <laughs> uh, crisis that we're facing. And I think that needs to be emphasized more. Um, so, you know, the kinds of uh, geoengineering um, uh, solutions that people come up with are um, uh, actually have a very um, um, you know, deleterious effect on um, you know the uh, sort of ecosystems in which they're uh, deployed and I think that um, will hopefully <laughs> draw people away from those kinds of uh, solutions but then, you know, I'm, I'm, but there's uh, you know it's it's hard to uh, you know but then you have to ask the question you know when when we sort of uh, are looking for work, you know, which we have to, <laughs> you know, basically engage in in order to put food on the table. Um, uh, you know, we try to find, you know, the best possible, <laughs> uh, you know, the least to sort of damaging thing that we can do. And um, sometimes people will t uh, take on jobs like that, and it's and you know we can't um, sort of judge them for it, and it's a way f for them to earn money. But I think we can we can certainly try to uh, persuade them politically about those kinds of questions. Um, yeah, um, the the question about congestion uh, taxes. Um, I think um, that that's actually a, a little bit of I think a, a kind of a regressive tax system in that it's applied uh, the same to everybody, right? So like it, no matter how rich or poor you are, if you're uh, if you you know are driving your car, you'll be uh, have to pay the same amount of tax. So it's really. Um, a tax on the poor, really, because for rich people it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, like they can they can easily um, pay the whatever fifteen dollars or whatever it is that you have to pay. Um, and, and so we have to. Um, uh, I, I think we have to find other solutions uh, to that. Um, and um, you know, um, the question of crime, as you were <laughs> mentioning, like if I, I don't think it would be related to the subways becoming free, right? I mean, I think that's a separate um, issue. Um, and we have to find ways of dealing with uh, crime that um, you know. Um, uh, you know, we, we don't have a very good solution <laughs> to deal with crime right now. I mean, it's just the the sort of the carceral system that exists right now is just uh, uh, just horrible. And uh, so we have to uh, think about that in a completely different um, sort of framework. That uh, you know, and separate it from. The, the issues issues of uh, climate change and um, e ecology, um, and, and I also wanted to just say w one other thing about. Um, I guess the question was about um, funding, right? About, uh, um, and uh, um, I, th I think that that is an issue because I, I think that um, research is funded um, based on what kinds of uh, results you are. Um, you, you know, you you, you um, want to promote, or um, so I think that you know. The, uh, for for instance, I mean, I think there's a long history of you know the 
the tobacco companies, you know, funding research, you know, showing that, you know, no, you know, it will not cause cancer, or like there's a, there's all this uncertainty, you know, <laughs> that's what they introduce, right? And and this is uh, dealt very well actually in this book by um, uh, uh, Naomi uh, Oreskes uh, and uh, I forget the other author's name, um, uh, the Merchants of uh, something or other, <laughs> I, I forget, but, uh, but that's a, a, you know, and she shows, um, the, the two authors actually, uh, show that um, um, there's uh, this kind of funding um, of research basically tries to, um, uh, uh, you know, create this uncertainty, <laughs> supposed uncertainty about uh, what is really obvious, um, and uh, they, d d d d you know, so they play a very pernicious role um, uh, and, I, and I think it is important to question the role of uh, big oil and all of these corporations uh, funding research. One cannot trust that research. Um. I'll also respond a bit to the second question in that um, I, have a, I have a different view than Ansar on it. Um, you know, personally, I feel like the folks that are part of the emerging CO2 removal industry need to be politicized, they need to be radicalized. I don't like the idea of driving them away. And the reason for that is that if we are not careful, there's really nothing stopping big oil from using CCS and CO2 removal as a sort of Trojan horse to continue influencing policy for years down the line. And I think there does need to be an alternative to that. Um, and um, having a more principled approach to CO2 removal with some very specific hard lines, um, to me, makes a lot of sense. I think that the problem that we're seeing with current US policy toward CO2 removal and CCS is that it doesn't have any of those hard lines. It just gives tax credits to anyone and it's being used, again, as a lifeline for polluting industry. But you can imagine al an alternative policy that would prohibit the usage of those tax credits for any company that continues to invest in fossil fuels. So I, I do think like folks in this industry, if you have those sets of values and morals, putting them into action, not only in your workplace, but also in your organizing can be really valuable. Um, hi, thanks for the presentation, y'all. Um, I'm so I'm, I'm interested in like this kind of current that I see in climate science right now, which I work in. Um, that's a kind of uh, movement towards deprofessionalization of the science itself, um, which is to say, like making climate models more accessible for regular use, um, so that local areas can understand their local, regional, and global climate impacts on a more dynamic basis, basically. Um, and I think that. There's a lot of opportunity here towards this kind of like information supporting actual like real time or more um, active community oriented climate mitigation efforts with which often will take a technological framework. Um, so I think thinking about how like Holly Jean Buck makes this argument um, that uh, technologies of geoengineering might be kind of appropriated for redistributive ends by the left, um, such by being like worker oriented pioneering new modes of kind of collectively owning governance around how our energy is created and how our resources are used. Um, I'm curious if you all have any thoughts on like this kind of gap between the creation of information often coming out of um, universities or more like academic institutions and then the use of it towards those redistributive ends. Um, I kind of see it as like there's a space between like many of the climate scientists that I work with um, are really passionate about, of course, like a more redistributive form of climate um, action. But for them, they see a kind of distance between the work that they do working on models um, and then it goes to the IPCC or something like that. And it's kind of just like, you know, then Dubai says like, oh, we're gonna, we're fixing everything. Don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, just curious if you all have any, any comments on, on that kind of space and what you might see as an opportunity there. Yeah, thank you both so much for your for your presentations. Um, Ansar, this question's for more for you, but but you know, please feel free to answer. Um, it's kind of an extension or question around your point about how kind of this carbon conversation or degree warming conversation is pretty reductive of the ecological crisis. 
Um, and in the adaptation space, I feel that we, we frame our technical conversations and hinge them on specific climate indicators. Um, something like, you know, annual average increase in daily maximum temperature. I mean, what even is that? And so, um, but we kind of need some of those more technical and pretty uh, hyper-specific metrics to do decision making. Um, so I was wondering, what would you recommend for people in the adaptation space and in the, in the climate space generally to reorient those technical conversations in a systems approach um, that doesn't really fail to, I think we fail to recognize the interconnectedness of our ecological system. So um, yeah, I'd love some advice on how to manage th those conversations. So like, given everything that you'll know about politics and your fields in general, like how would you phase out fossil fuels? Um, um, what, do you want to go, go because I'm a, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sure. Um, <clears throat> I might work backward. Um, how to phase out fossil fuels. I think that um, there are clear steps at the domestic level to take to phase out fossil fuels. Um, so um, prohibiting uh, drilling on federal lands um, is one of the you know, clearest steps that can be taken. Um, and there are a lot of powers that can be unlocked by the Biden administration if he declares a climate emergency. Um, so different activist groups, Sunrise Movement, Greenpeace, where I actually work, have been calling on Biden to declare a climate emergency not only as a symbol of urgency, but also because it unlocks a whole range of presidential powers. Um, so I think those are two of like the clearest steps. Um, I think that um, just transition considerations are really, really key to phasing out fossil fuels as well. Um, so doing it in a way that um, has some sort of transition program for workers that doesn't only hurt the working class is uh, really important. And that is also sometimes very complicated because the quality of jobs that the oil and gas sector offers are typically pretty high. Um, so folks who are proposing a fossil fuel phase out need some way to, to grapple with that. That's actually one of the reasons that some folks like Holly Jean Buck are supportive of carbon capture and storage because it, in its closeness to the oil and gas industry, seems to offer a similar kind of job. Um, there are um, other jobs that you could imagine um, for retired oil and gas workers. Um, there are thousands upon thousands of unused leaking wells that need to be plugged. Um, and in California, there's some legislation to plug those wells. Um, so you, I could see phasing out fossil fuels in a whole variety of ways. Another way um, that I'll end with um, is uh, starting at the state level and working your way up from there. Um, so California being a major oil producing state has an opportunity to take more active steps to phase out fossil fuels. Other states um, could follow suit. Many of them won't because many of them are Republican uh, controlled, but uh, having a state kind of take the first step um, allows others to follow and also creates some sort of blueprint or testing for a domestic phase out. This is just domestic. Globally, uh, that's, that's for another time, maybe. Um, you want to, okay. Um, yeah, um, g uh, the uh, question about the redistributive possibilities, I didn't completely understand like, um, what you meant by it. Could you, would you mind just elaborating a little bit? Uh, yeah, I'm curious about um, moving between creation of information, particularly in academic institutions, yeah. and bridging that gap between that and actual use by organizers or for redistributive ends, 
rather than feeding the same pipeline into IPCC reports that don't include anything. I see. Yeah. So in other words, if I understand you correctly, then how to make um, sort of academic research sort of relevant to, um, yeah, yeah to, to, to uh, uh, right, like right. It's already relevant, but it's like how do we make it? Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I'm, yeah, right, I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, the, I mean, this is one of the frustrations of the whole uh, problem is that even uh, people who, uh, you know, W should understand what the uh, you know the consequences of the and this research don't do anything with it right and so um, and and I think that's uh, you know it's really hard to understand from a sort of just logical point of view like why isn't it being used to uh, do something um, rather than just uh, letting things go on and I um, and it's very uh, frustrating <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, so I, I guess I don't really have a very um, uh, good answer to that. I don't know if um, you want to say something on that. Um, I mean, closing space between the research that you do and the action, um, the clearest way I can think to answer it is maybe with like examples. Um, I think that creating open source research tools can be really productive and very helpful. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the nonprofit, the Louisiana, Louisiana Bucket Brigade, I think kind of like demonstrates some of the uh, benefit that can do when you equip communities with tools and knowledge to um, take on the fight. Um, but that's not going to be a realistic solution for many scientists and departments um, whose work is maybe a little more detached from what's happening on the ground. So the way I think about it is the importance of having a scientific practice and having a political practice and um, not allowing yourself to, to view your work as your only kind of contribution. So the question you asked about um, sort of the um, the use of metrics and the interconnections between um, sort of these different systems and how to how to come up with um, ways of um, I guess measuring things so you can set goals uh, and so on. I mean I think that's a really interesting question. Um, the, w what we have going on right now is a, is a, um, you know that we just have a sort of a single <laughs> um, um, object that we're looking at the uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, parts per million of uh, carbon um, and I think that in, uh, when we think about um, sort of ecology um, each uh, sort of uh, um, we have to think about it in terms of sort of qualitative uh, ways and the interconnectedness and so on and uh, sometimes the um, the, the causal relationships themselves are very uh, complex and in fact not very straightforward um, uh, and uh, you know for, for instance um, somebody um, mentioned uh, to me that um, uh, th there's uh, th when you look at sort of the um, uh, the ocean uh, the rise in the ocean temperature it's it's actually uh, warming at a much higher pace than um, was predicted and uh, it, it, one possible explanation that, uh, is that the sort of regulations now on um, uh, ships and so on have uh, you know basically made uh, them less polluting and so what that has done is that it has decreased the amount of aerosols and uh, um, you know so it, it it's now increasing at a so it's a kind of this paradoxical effect where on the one hand you're uh, you know um, you're producing less co2 but um, you know it has the uh, this kind of complex um, um, effect, um, and so, b but I do do think that um, yeah, metrics um, have to be in, um, you know uh, can be useful in particular systems, uh, that particular sort of problems that one is working on, but they have to be particular to that uh, system. So it's hard to give a very general <laughs> answer, but I but I think that the the most important thing for, for me is uh, you know what you said, which is the interconnectedness. Um, and that's uh, something that we really have to think about, that what we do um, can have um, very complex um, consequences. And so, um, yeah, um, and that's not a very satisfying <laughs> answer, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, and then, um, yeah, the uh, how to phase out fossil fuels. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a very cl clear answer, but I think one um, uh, one of the um, really interesting aspects of uh, living through COVID uh, was this sort of drastic um, sort of truncation of uh, <laughs> both our sort of uh, you know the good aspects of our lives, but also like you know the um, um, you know, having to commute, having to do all these things that, um, you know, that, that we used to do, like travel and so on. And uh, what was uh, really interesting was, uh, to me was that, uh, you know, the world um, sort of was able to function to, you know, um, whatever degree. And uh, it, it had uh, very startling effects on, um, you know, the environment. Like, for instance, um, you know, I read about these reports in Venice, for instance, like, you know, which had this incredible recovery of the ecology, um, you know, like all kinds of, um, you know, uh, species that people hadn't seen in <laughs> decades all of a sudden appeared. Um, uh, so I, I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, w what kinds of lessons can one learn from, uh, uh, from COVID, you know, like, what, what are there aspects of it that we can, you know, um, embrace uh, now and uh, um, and and really, um, uh, yeah, uh, and maybe th they will allow us to then think about how to, you know, completely phase out uh, fossil fuels. But I don't have a very good answer, obviously. But uh, it's just um, I, th I thought a very interesting experience to go through and just see how much of an effect, you know, even. S small changes in our behavior has on the, on the environment. I have two more thoughts before we move on. Um, on the question of metrics, I think that the metrics that you choose are really important. And um, one example I have is the switch that the UN made, not entirely a switch, but for since 2010, the United Nations has been putting out a series of reports called the emissions gap reports that look at the size of the emissions gap um, in terms of where we're headed and our stated climate goals. And just a few years ago, the UN also started putting out a report called the production gap report, which switched it on its head and looked at fossil fuel production trends versus where we need to go. And a lot of the data that kind of goes into these analyses is the same, but that change in framing has an enormous difference because it puts the onus on production to change um, and puts the spotlight more on where um, I think like it needs to go. Um, and that brings us back to the question of phasing out fossil fuels in a way, because when you read that report, um, you're confronted with the idea that production needs to slow or production needs to be halted. Um, there's a movement toward um, a global fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, um, and it has signatories um, including some fairly small countries, um, but this is a kind of international agreement that I think could bring us closer to a fossil fuel phase out. Um, yeah, these are the very like political answers as well, and I think there's just like so much that's left unsaid right now about actually like building movements on the ground and building political power as well. Um, but focusing on the policy, those are some of my thoughts. One question from online. Uh, Delaney says, what are your perspectives on carbon removal as a component of climate reparations and or as a publicly owned industry, assuming big oil is removed as a stakeholder with any decision making power? Um, thinking about the five, the past sort of like five, ten years, we've seen a huge boom in like nature-based carbon removal, like non-technological, for example, avoided deforestation, conservation efforts. I'm still sort of forming my opinion on on the role that plays. I'm really curious to hear um, where you see nature-based solutions and carbon removal, like sort of positioned in the hierarchy of solutions. How I'm sort of seeing it is that like, um, you know, it's still a form of commodifying nature in a relationship to it, which is productive, um, and sort of how we got to this, to this place, right? Um, and then a second piece of it is that it also still perpetuates pollution and emissions. 
um, from players who don't want to decarbonize and act on real zero. Um, but then on, on, the, on the sort of flip side, it's like I see an opportunity there for, um, it's not sort of uh, enacting technological harm in the way that um, these techno solutions um, can on our relationship with the ecosystem. Um, and it's more sort of quote unquote harmonious in a sense um, when you're just conserving mm -hmm. an ecosystem that already exists. Um, of course, the caveat there is if the, if the project is done right and thoroughly and, and um, with integrity. So that's my question, yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I like that <laughs> sort of idea. And um, I, um, I think that it's, it's sort of, um, if we get away from sort of um, using nature sort of instrumentally, like we're just trying to reduce, you know, the carbon or whatever, but rather allowing it to sort of restore itself, you know, because it, it has um, that uh, capacity. And, you know, we, we saw that, uh, you know, as I was mentioning with uh, Venice, you know, um, when you um, stop doing, <laughs> um, you know, um, active harm to the environment, to, the, to nature, um, you, um, you know, um, sometimes heals itself and uh, and I think that, that there's real um, uh, yeah I, I think I think that's a great idea and like you know there are um, th I, I read this uh, book um, I forget what it's, uh, it's it's not I think it's called wilding it's about this um, farm in um, in England where uh, where they basically um, were uh, you know kept making a loss as a farm <laughs> and then they basically just stopped doing anything and let so um, and they did do some active things um, as well but but a lot of it was um, just letting um, sort of nature <laughs> take its course so to speak and uh, it was really um, very interesting I mean species that had they, uh, of uh, birds and so on that they hadn't seen in um, like decades all of a sudden reemerged and so on. so I think I think there's that's really um, powerful and I, I think um, it, it would be uh, th there they were not trying to have this kind of instrumental view of nature you know they weren't trying to manipulate it they were just um, <laughs> letting it be in a sense and I think that's really um, uh, a powerful way of approaching um, you know um, um, yeah like you know trying to uh, come up with a much healthier relationship to nature yeah um, the uh, question f uh, did you want to answer this question or um, you can go first, and I'll answer both as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, about uh, carbon removal as a possible solution. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it all depends on how one looks at it. As I was um, saying, you know, I think most of the um, solutions that are um, offered, um, I d it, to me, they don't seem like real um, solutions, and they seem very problematic in a number of different ways. And it's not just because uh, of who owns it. Um, there are carbon removal, um, uh, you know, corporations um, that exist which are not, um, you know, uh, fossil fuel companies, um, and they could potentially be publicly owned, but. I don't think that necessarily removes the sort of problematic aspects. Um, so, uh, uh, but on the other hand, I don't want to say that there's no such, <laughs> um, you know, possibility. So um, it would it would have to depend on what exactly is being uh, uh, suggested. Um, yeah. So. I, uh, the, the idea of CDR as reparation or uh, redistributional justice, I think is a really interesting one because the US you know, has so much historical responsibility for the climate crisis and phasing out fossil fuels simply would not be enough to address that. Um, I think more important than that is ensuring financial transfers and financing from the global north to the global south for um, climate mitigation and climate solutions free from um, from uh, sort of exploitative debt conditions. Um, and there's a lot of work at COP, a lot of, you know, um, advocates wanting to figure out how the global north will transfer funds to the global south. Um, I think that needs to be worked out first. And I also think that maybe there is a role for CO2 removal as reparative 
uh, justice. Um, but we're far from it. I think what's much more likely is that CO2 removal um, will be under the control of big oil. Um, and because of that, the pipelines are going to be routed through lands where um, you know, folks are already sort of already bearing the brunt of the oil industry's pollution and racism, which is a horrible shame. Um, what was the other question again? Sorry, I get lost. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, the, and the other one was about um, sort of having more natural solutions oh, to, yes. uh, to letting nature, restoring <clears throat> nature. Yeah. Um, this is a really good question, and I think that um, to me it kind of shines a spotlight on where I see mistakes being made. You know, in my view, I think that there are there's there's sometimes a preference for nature-based solutions versus technological-based solutions, um, and I think what it comes down to much more so than the technology is the implementation. So um, one key example of that is the red program for reforestation um, that uh, has been very problematic um, just because it's pulling just because you know it's based on nature and um, working with nature or trees or plants doesn't mean it's going to be implemented effectively um, so I think I mean obviously oops Restoring nature needs to be, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so crucial to achieving any of our climate goals. It's crucial for other ecological reasons. Um, but I'm kind of, I'm with Ansar on this, that you really can't separate it from, um, from nature's ecological functions, from the ways that it has, um, from its traditional stewards. Um, you know, it's so much more like the metric of, of reforestation or tons of CO2, it just doesn't fit in this instance. Um, I felt the need to ask this last question, but I first just wanted to uh, thank you so much for the um, uh, perspective that it's really changing my understanding of the um, role of um, geoengineering as sort of being the continuing historical excuse for fossil fuel companies. Um, but I just wanted to ask about um, nuclear power, energy density, and community oversight, of, and whether community oversight of, of an energy dense means of product, like mode of energy production is possible. Also, I know one of the examples you gave of the forest in Germany that's being, uh, is about to be demolished to make way for coal plants um, is kind of a response to uh, Germany's denuclearization after uh, Fukushima. Um, and uh, the oil and gas industry has really leaped on that to sort of show, try to demonstrate, or yeah, just to take take control of other renewable energy sources. Um, yeah, uh, so to say that it was a response to um, sort of the denuclearization of uh, Germany is to sort of accept the narrative of the, you know, the government why they uh, want to uh, uh, do this. I mean, um, you know, Germany is doing fine, <laughs> you know, with that. Um, uh, so uh, the, 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 the um, and nuclear energy will n never solve the, uh, uh, the this uh, uh, crisis. And there, and there, and, and it's you can kind of it's like a very it's a really false promise uh, because this has been going on for quite some time where they keep promising you know we need to bring in more nuclear power plants online. And, uh, but they keep failing to do so, and the reason is because they are, go so over budget, and they they take like you know uh, decades to um, to commission and so on, um, and uh, and they're dangerous. I mean that's uh, you know uh, th that's uh, been shown um, you know through these uh, various accidents. Um, and uh, sort of, uh, you know, and there you, you always like hear this hype about sort of these uh, more modular uh, nuclear reactors and so on. But it, I mean, that's been around for a very long time too. So uh, I don't think that that's ever going to um, s solve the problem. But, but you perhaps. Oh. The possibility of community accountability and said, like, you mentioned ah. this dangerous problem and often ignores community concerns. But um, is that something that's sort of like under the you're mentioning? It's not necessarily the technology, it's the 
So you mean that the, the, the community could have oversight over the nuclear power plants? Or, uh, sorry, or? This whole, this whole discussion is talking about like, like you mentioned, it's about leaving space for political points and dependence on the scientific. I just, yeah, I, I have difficulty like, with the energy density question of really conceptualizing uh, that. Also. So, yeah, I, I was just hoping that I could address the energy density question of like, leaving the car as a very energy dense energy. And yeah, obviously, it's not. Um, <coughs> Yeah, um, right, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that's, um, yeah, I mean, it just uh, the historical record is not very encouraging, right, and uh, so I think a, a nuclear uh, reactor w just came online uh, uh, this year, but, but at the same time there were like two or three that were cancelled, you know, because they were just going way over budget. And it's an extremely expensive prospect, I mean, like billions of dollars, and they always go over budget. I mean, there was one that was canceled uh, just very recently that had an initial sort of budget projection of like 3.5 billion and then went up to like 8 billion, and then they just canceled it. I mean, and that's not, it's a very typical story. It's not um, anomalous in any <laughs> sense. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I personally do not have a very strong perspective on nuclear nuclear energy um but to me um it kind of gets to a different question of accepting certain risks and trade-offs in how we deal with the climate crisis um i think we have passed the point of dealing effectively with the climate crisis in a way that doesn't involve doing some other kinds of harm um and to act like we can avoid any sort of negative impacts um, is harmful and disingenuous. So um, at a certain point, it's just like, what do you do with that knowledge? Um, I, th I, th it, I think the community ownership question or like piece is um, interesting and worthwhile. Um, but nuclear energy specifically, I don't really know. Uh, I would love to think about it more and talk about it more. Um, but we just don't have the luxury to be too picky about what options we move forward with. I think the only live question that we have right now is what combination of mitigation, technology, and adaptation is just is going to reduce the most harm. It's going to lead us to the best possible outcome. All right. Thank you so much. I want to pass it over to you for any, I don't know if those were any last words or if you wanted to, because we are at 5 o'clock to close out. Is there anything you wanted to close the class out with? Um, feel free to share them now. Or, yeah. Um, Perfect. I think I'm done. Thanks, right. everyone. Yeah. Thank yeah. yeah. Thanks, everyone. A huge round of applause. Um, I think we are still, we are still in this kind of this process of figuring out how do we move forward like with a materialist understanding of what we have now and what the place that we need to go, which is going to take a lot of discussion and debate and figuring out all the time. Um, so I think this was a great point in terms of like jumping off and going forth and continuing your own studies and your own discussions and your own debate, um, but always with the understanding that we have to find a solution as, you know, before we can't any longer. Okay, that sounds really sad. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, really, it's a harsh reality. But anyway, um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, continue to stay in touch. Uh, we're going to relaunch, or this is the last seminar of this particular um, segment of Science Against Capitalism, but stay tuned. Also, if this is your first time at the People's Forum, definitely check us out downstairs. If you have any questions, feel free to ask the person at the front desk. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to Ansar and Andres. This is really great. Um, I hope you guys have a great day and see you later.